Uh, my name is Stephen Gordon uh, from Red Hat. I'm here with my uh, peers, Adrian Hoban from Intel, uh, Alan Kavanagh from Ericsson. Um, today we'll be talking about OpenStack enhancements to support NFB use cases. Um, apparently, if you hang around at the end, you have a chance to win this Intel Nook. Um, so if you didn't get a ticket, I believe there's a gentleman going around still handing them out at the back there. Um, so get in quick. Um, so today, we'll be presenting on a couple of different things. Um, so first of all, I'll be trying to present a bit of a map of all the ways to engage around NFV and OpenStack um, and the various bodies involved. Uh, Adrian will be talking uh, a little bit about some extensions uh, that are in Kilo for NFV, um, developed by both our own companies and the broader community as well. Uh, and finally, Alan will be painting a picture um, of what we need to do to continue to evolve the cloud to support NFV. Um, so how did we get here? Um, so in October 2012, um, the Etsy standards body um, formed the Network Function Virtualization SIG, or ISG, sorry, um, with a view to transforming their networks. So transforming from the reliance on a physical hardware devices, uh, which are very explicitly built for a uh, special function, um, to virtualizing those appliances and running them on commodity hardware in virtualization. Um, Later, in September of 2014, um, the industry uh, then moved to the next stage in terms of, OK, we've created this framework, um, this specification for what we want to achieve at a high level. How do we take that and build something real? Um, so that's when the open platform for NFV, or OPNFV, was formed as a Linux, collaborative, uh, a Linux, Linux Foundation collaborative project. Um, so that's where they're trying to build, effectively, a reference platform, um, initially composed of uh, OpenStack and Open Daylight, but later including other variations as well uh, for running NFE uh, applications on top of. Um, so in terms of decoding, just some simple terms for some in the room who may not be familiar uh, with what I'm talking about here. So ETSI uh, is the European Telecommunications Standards in Institute. Um, NFV is obviously network function virtualization, although um, as Alan will touch on later in this presentation, uh, the virtualization is kind of more conceptual than specifically tied to the implementation. So things like bare metal, containers, and so on can still be relevant. Uh, it's more about having the agility uh, versus that old model where things were built very specifically to the hardware to move things around and optimize the network. Um, finally, uh, Etsy um, has the NFE ISG, as I mentioned. So that's an industry specification group. Um, they create what are called group specifications. Um, documenting uh, things like the terminology and agree, uh, or documenting agreeing on things like the terminology, the use cases they're talking about, and so on. So phase one um, of the Etsy NFE effort really focused on um, converging on a common set of network requirements, um, including where they existed, any existing standards they could identify, um, and endeavoring to stimulate innovation um, in an open ecosystem of vendors. So both the traditional vendors that they'd worked with up until this point, and also vendors more engaged in some of the open source projects that we're going to talk about today. Um, phase two um, is really still getting underway at the moment. Uh, so endeavoring to grow an interoperable uh, virtual network function um, ecosystem, um, and also to continue to more thoroughly specify uh, reference points and requirements. Um, so extensions of work done, work done in phase one. Uh, while achieving broader industry engagement, again, both with traditional and newer vendors in this space. Um, finally, uh, another aspect of phase two is clarifying um, the somewhat interrelated um, but different um, intersections between network function virtualization and software-defined networking technology. Um, so some people will be familiar with, potentially, uh, the Etsy NFE architecture. Uh, so this is kind of the, the diagram that appears everywhere. Um, primarily, when we want to talk about OpenStack, uh, we're looking in the right-hand corner here, uh, the Virtual Infrastructure Manager, uh, and also, to some degree, uh, the middle layer, where we talk about the Virtual Compute, Virtual Storage, and Virtual Network um, componentry. Uh, so for example, in the initial um, OPNFE reference platform um, based on this architecture, um, you know, Open Daylight would be your virtual network. But that's not to say that's the only potential solution. Um, as I mentioned, OPNFV is starting to try and uh, build some of this into a real solution, uh, focusing initially on the NFV infrastructure and the virtual infrastructure management. So again, this is where OpenStack comes in. Um, they're focused on delivering consistency, performance, and interoperability uh, between the components in that reference platform uh, while working with the upstream communities. Uh, so the idea being that 
They want to work with the upstream communities, including OpenStack, to build um, the functionality they need into the actual projects rather than carrying code themselves necessarily. Um, so the initial OPNFV uh, focus area is kind of in that area I just talked about. So the virtual infrastructure manager, um, the virtual compute, virtual storage, and virtual network um, componentry, and also the physical hardware that this is all running on. So there's uh, a big investment um, getting kickstarted in OPNFE around how we actually test this on real hardware as well. Um, so also with OPNFE, um, there's a growing list of projects within that effort. Um, so these are uh, divided into requirements projects. So for example, uh, the doctor project around fault management. Um, Integration and testing projects, uh, so IPv6 enabled OPNFV, uh, where you know, we talk quite a bit about the fact that most infrastructure components these days should work with IPv6. They want to prove it works with IPv6, again, using that hardware infrastructure and so on to do continuous integration based on that. There's also collaborative development projects, uh, for example, around fast path service, service and quality metrics, and also documentation projects. So given this reference platform, how do we actually deploy um, and use this and document that? Uh, moving further into the OpenStack sphere, um, so within OpenStack there's a telecommunications working group uh, which was originally formed as the NFV sub-team uh, around the Atlanta summit um, and created out of many of the same pressures that OPNFV um, came to be created out of. Um, so helping uh, telecom operators and network equipment providers um, artic articulate their requirements in a way that the open source community without necessarily the same level of exposure to telecoms and network function virtualization um, could understand an action. Um, so we endeavor to define and prioritize requirements, um, harmonize those inputs uh, with now the help of other groups like the product working group in OpenStack uh, into the OpenStack projects themselves, um, including um, you know, many of the um, members of these various groups in a sec. So there are groups um, that are, or sorry, organizations that are members of both OPNFE and Etsy NFE. Uh, there are also plenty um, that also are members of the OpenStack community and have developers uh, who work on some of these things as well. Uh, so the working group scope also goes into helping with blueprint and patch creation, submission and review, and helping people in how they um, message around that and explain their problem space properly. Um, final thing I wanted to mention on that was also that one of the reasons this was created as an uh, OpenStack subteam uh, was to really help with moving the conversation closer to the OpenStack community, so helping to advocate for the, the telecommunications and NFE use cases um, in an area where it had visibility to the wider community, not so linked into that space. Um, finally, of course, uh, we have OpenStack itself, uh, which, as you have no doubt seen this week, is a very large community of technical contributors in a wide array of loosely governed projects and a growing array of loosely governed projects. Um, NFE requirements typically don't fall into neatly into one box that says Nova or Neutron or Heat. Um, more often than not, the requirements um, have action that requires across groups of projects. Um, so actioning those requires buy-in uh, from these diverse groups, and that's what we're trying to help with. Um, most OpenStack projects uh, are moving to a kind of specification process for approving major changes. Um, the ingredients of a good specification basically are a problem description, including use cases, which of course is what we're trying to help build. Um, a concrete design proposal, uh, which has been created with, um, or has clearly been created with giving thought to how OpenStack is actually architected and trying not to also damage other use cases, if that makes sense. And also someone to actually implement it, of course. Um, so what we're trying to do um, in this kind of sphere uh, of related, somewhat interrelated bodies uh, is work together at that intersection point between all four uh, where we can achieve success. Um, so there is some overlap between the various groups in terms of mission, membership, scope, and activities. Uh, so navigating it can be a little bit tough. Um, and in general, where we see this merging of the world, um, where we see or where we try and help um, the telecoms community and NFE community um, and the OpenStack community from the other end uh, talk the same languages in that kind of area intersecting between OPNFE and the telco working group in OpenStack. I'm now going to hand over uh, to Adrian, who's going to talk a little about uh, improvements we actually made in Kilo uh, for NFE use cases. Thank you, Steve. So uh, what I'm going to introduce are some of the changes that both our companies and many other contributors in the community have worked towards during Kilo. 
Uh, when we met last time at the Paris Summit, we talked about uh, the type of things we wanted to get added to help with the VNF deployment, adding the tuning knobs that we needed for that to be successful. So I'm going to show some of the advancements that have happened in that space. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, introduce the NUMA non-uniform memory architecture capability on modern servers. And this is typically when you've got a multi-socket system, the memory is usually closer to one socket or another. What that means is if you're accessing memory that's close to one of your sockets, that, that runs at its fastest, most efficient path. But if you happen to be accessing memory that's crossing that inter-socket connection, it's still quick, but it just isn't quite as quick as if it's local memory. So one of the changes that went into Juno actually was the um, new topology filter. And what this allows you to do is uh, specify that you want to co-locate these various uh, CPU workloads onto a single socket. And by doing that, that gets you access to that local memory which runs really quickly. During Kilo, um, a strict policy on that was added, so it's, it's very directed. Previously, it was um, kind of the kernel doing the best effort to get you there. One of the extensions that we made uh, during the Kilo process, though, was to add I.O. awareness to that. So for you folks that are working on high-performance network workloads, you really want the network device that's close to the, um, your processing to be uh, on the same socket. So in this example, if, for instance, you, um, you knew for some physical connectivity purposes you wanted Nick B to be providing you with the traffic, then we needed to be able to specify that uh, your workloads, the, in, as part of the, the NUMA selection, would pick the socket that had that network device closely associated with it. That allows you then to get access to that local memory. So you're running in a very, very efficient way, very little uh, overhead in the system, um, not exercising that inter-socket communication. Uh, next up, I want, just want to talk briefly about simultaneous multi-threading, also known as hyper-threading. It's a capability within the hardware to run multiple threads in parallel on the same uh, execution unit. Uh, this is something we've implemented on platforms because it's a, a very efficient way of getting extra performance out of your compute resources. From an operating system perspective, when you turn on uh, simultaneous multi-threading, you end up with twice the number of cores than you have actual execution units in the system. I'm showing a, a typical numbering scheme for how this works out in Linux. So for instance, if we look over on the far left on the execution unit, that shows up as CPU 0 and CPU uh, 4. So this is something you need to be aware of later on when we start looking at the new features we've added in OpenStack, which is around CPU pinning. Um, right now, there's a, a policy that allows us um, to pin particular uh, virtual CPUs to the, their physical units. The first of four policies that's actually implemented is called the prefer policy. And with this policy, what we're able to do is, is specify that the guest OS vCPUs get associated with, uh, in effect, sibling uh, physical CPU processes on the host. The next policy we're going to implement, and this is going to happen during Liberty, is the separate policy. And with separate, what it allows you to do is specify that your, your guest uh, virtual CPUs are pinned onto uh, physically different execution units. Now you'll note on guest B here, this is not NUMA aware. So the CPU pinning with separate will be to pin it onto separate units, but it doesn't uh, include a NUMA awareness. For that, we need the previous feature I talked about, the NUMA awareness. Isolate will be the second of three policies that are going to come in Liberty. And with Isolate, what you actually do is specify that a virtual CPU should only be mapped to a physical CPU that does not have a sibling already mapped. So that gets you great uh, isolation on the host to make sure that you're, you can run in a very deterministic manner. And the third policy we want to introduce in Liberty is Avoid, which means don't deploy a workload on a, a processor that, that hasn't been configured with SMT. Some workloads um, just prefer not to have that kind of simultaneous multi-threading enabled. The next feature I want to introduce is around huge page table support. So in Kilo, we introduced that. We said we had some patches for it. This has been upstreamed, uh, or sorry, that was in Juno. It has been upstreamed now for Kilo. The reason we talk about huge page table support has got to do with part of the memory processing subsystem and the processor. There's a, a component called translation look aside buffer, and the TLB is responsible in helping address translation. Within the TLB, you've got a cache that looks at your page translation table, and when you use huge pages, and by huge I mean two megabytes or maybe one gigabyte in page size, what it actually allows you to do is for have 
the, the fixed number of entries you've got in that cache span far more of your memory address space. So when you are doing address translations, like what happened uh, quite frequently in uh, virtual machine transactions, uh, your likelihood of hitting an entry in the cache is improved and you get a far uh, faster uh, sort of address translation capability. So they're the capabilities we've landed in Kilo. And what I want to show now is how do you pull all these things together to deploy uh, an NFE? So this is kind of like a, a basic NFE template. And the first thing we want to do before we start deploying NFE is set up the host in a way that's more suitable for these type of workloads. Uh, the first change I have here highlighted in yellow is on the grub config. And we, in this example, I'm saying uh, specify a huge page size of one uh, gigabyte. And I'm going to have eight of those pages. The next thing you typically want to do here is isolate the host CPUs. Now, what I mean by that is the, the host scheduler is still running workloads. And what's quite an effective thing to do is to say, I want to isolate an execution unit on each of the sockets you've got. So my example would be uh, CPU 0 and 4 on the first socket. So you'll see they don't show up in the isolate CPUs. I'm, I'm taking these cores away from the host kernel. Because we're doing some host level config, it's a good idea to create an aggregate so that your scheduler can be aware of what platforms have been properly configured for an NFE deployment. So um, in this example, I'm just creating an NFE aggregate. You should add whatever hosts you have in your environment configured to that. It's also good practice to then to create some kind of a default so that you know your other hosts that haven't been configured in that way don't accidentally have a, a high priority NFE workload schedule to them. Moving then into the configuration side of things, within Nova, what we want to set up here is um, part of the SROV capabilities that were added in Juno. So uh, a typical example is you create a PCI alias. In this case, I'm showing an Intel NIC um, code name Niantic. We show the vendor ID and product ID. And we also specify in the pass-through the whitelist. So the whitelist allows you to specify what uh, PCIe devices in your system get exposed up to the Nova database. In this example, uh, I'm highlighting a, a physical PCIe connectivity. There are other options you've got. Sometimes you might want to go to that granularity because you don't want to allocate all of your NICs for SRI or V type support. Uh, we need to update the, uh, the nova.conf so that we have the right uh, number of schedulers specified. So in this example, the aggregate um, extra spec filter, the PCI pass-through filter, and the NUMA are going to be needed. Within libvert, we want to make sure that libvert is configured to pass all of the CPU properties right through into the guest OS. Because uh, things guests often want to do is, um, let's say if you're running a, a VPN service of some description, or, or you had some kind of crypto need and you want to get access to uh, specialized instructions that can help with that, you need all of those CPU properties exposed up. Uh, the CPU pin set here is, is a way of telling libvert that these are the particular CPUs that it's allowed to do some uh, CPU pinning with. And you know they match the same ones that we've isolated from the host. So that gets you that robust isolation. Moving more into the network side, in this sample example, I'm showing a VLAN configuration. So we want to set up um, the ML2 drivers with VLAN support. You've got OpenV switch in here and the SRIOV NIC driver. Down at the bottom, you'll notice the physical network uh, ID that we're associating with this uh, network and the, the amount of um, VLAN range that we want to specify. Uh, in the SROV config itself, there's a related property for that PCIe device that you want to have allocated to your guest. So we're calling out the vendor ID and product ID here. In this case, we don't need an agent for this device. Others do, so the agent uh, required filter we set default, or to true in that case. And we're also saying that the physical device mapping, it we're, again, we're calling out that physical um, uh, network identifier that we specified earlier. So once we get through that kind of key um, network configuration, we move into the uh, f uh, flavor creation. So uh, a typical NFE flavor, we want to specify that CPU policy is dedicated so that we can pick up that preferred mechanism that's been implemented. Uh, as an example, one of the CPU features I'm calling out here, AES, uh, anything that's uh, exposed with CPU ID is available to be called out here as an extra spec. Um, noting the NIC that we um, defined earlier on and the number of virtual functions from that you want to allocate for this flavor. And uh, in this case, making sure we're targeting the same aggregate that we configured. Um, other um, extra specs you've got to do is then on the NUMA side, the number of NUMA nodes you want, 
uh, the CPU pinning onto that NUMA node, how many cores you're asking for, what kind of memory policy and strict has been implemented, so you get definitely get that uh, co-located memory, and then the number of, uh, uh, or sorry, the page size that you want allocated. Okay, so we've got our flavor set up, we've got everything configured, now we need to create the network. Again, this is more of a, a tenant-facing thing, so we'll create um, uh, our, our network, we're going to associate it with that physical net, NFE, um, network identifier earlier. Uh, we'll create any subnets if you need it. And down on the bottom here, I'm showing the port create command, and this is where we're pulling in that um, uh, VNIC uh, uh, binding type of direct, which says the SROV device is passed all the way through to the guest. And once you've done all that, you can go ahead and boot your device. And you should be running on a platform that's been nicely configured to give you uh, very efficient, very uh, deterministic performance. So a couple of other notable changes that have gone into Kilo. Uh, first one I want to mention is the uh, ML2 mechanism driver for OVS with um, the data plane development kit acceleration support in there. So in this OVS mechanism driver, this is a, in effect a fork of the standard OVS mech driver. It's something we chose to do because uh, this is a user space vSwitch. And functionality is slightly different, and, and certainly the type of functionality that's available is different than what's in kernel. So we thought it's better just to have a very clear separation on these. In the future, we may be able to combine them back together again, but that depends on how um, OVS with DBDK and NetDev support uh, enhances in the future. Uh, this implementation supports DVR in both VLAN and VXLAN mode. Um, there's a path to really high performance capability, so please try it out. Um, another extension that has gone into Kilo as well is uh, this VLAN trunking API extension. So uh, this hasn't really extended VLAN trunking capability, but it does give you a way of knowing if you've requested VLAN trunking, whether or not you're getting it. Uh, it's something uh, companies here, uh, Cisco, Ericsson, and others are very interested in pushing. It's a, a key requirement for um, uh, NFE deployments. The port security disable extension is another interesting one, uh, very important for uh, many uh, network type applications where they're not the endpoint of the data. And when the default security rules are uh, kind of related to anti-spoofing, they can stop traffic getting there if it's not meant to be the endpoint, we need to make sure we can disable that so we can route traffic into that network node and have it do its thing and effectively become a bump in the wire type device. Okay, so with that, that's again, I just want to clarify that this has been a, a fantastic collaboration between many people in the NFE community, people coming through from OPNFE, from um, at CNFE, from the Telco Working Group, and uh, collaborators across all the various projects. So too many names to mention here, but uh, it's a fantastic move towards uh, making OpenStack a platform where we can actually deploy NFE workloads. With that, I'd like to invite Alan Kavanagh from Ericsson up to... Thanks, Ed. So. I'm going to talk about uh, what I call the dirty little secrets um, inside the uh, OpenStack community. So I'm going to give a talk around VNF deployments, the different scenarios and work cases basically, and what's important from an NFE uh, perspective, and us basically as a, one of the VNF uh, largest providers in the world actually, what we regard as basically what is the most important we actually want to see out of OpenStack. So let's talk a little bit about where we've actually evolved. Right. So a long, long time ago, we were actually shipping boxes. So we basically shipped the box to a customer, he would place an order, and it took several months. It took several months basically for the delivery basically to get there, it took a couple of weeks then basically for the customer to rack install, like connect it to his switches, connect it to his routers, a couple more weeks basically to run test cases, you know, configuration management solutions that he actually wanted to put on board. And it was a long period of time basically before they actually got like a network service node basically installed and ready, ready and running in production. So the reason why we actually are here in OpenStack with Intel, Red Hat, and a couple of other community members is what we are really trying to do is actually speed the process. So if you can imagine what happened to the music industry over the last 20 years when people were actually going into you know, HMV, Virgin Record Store, we originally started to buy like LP vinyls, then we actually started to buy cassettes, then we started to buy CDs, and then we kind of don't buy them anymore. So when we want music, we were to listen to that stream through Spotify, or we actually want to get that basically from an iTunes or basically music digital store online. And the reason why we actually want to do that is because of the speed, right? I'm not willing to wait basically you know, to hop in my car, drive down to the store, make the purchase, come home, rip that, install it on my MP3 player. I actually want it right now. So this is one of the things that we are actually 
working towards in OpenStack. What we are really trying to do is basically decouple the hardware from the software, which is really what NFE is really trying to do. So what we still need, of course, is we still need a box. The problem is, is that the software can sit on multiple boxes on multiple platforms. And really what NFE is really trying to do is actually make sure that those <coughs> software pieces can actually sit on industry standard like x86 platforms. Okay. So where have we gone in the last 25 years? So what we used to ship, we used to ship a piece of software. That piece of software was customized with a customized host operating system, and it was then customized again for a specific hardware platform. So the traditional ones that you've actually heard of over the last 30 years is MIPS, PowerPC, ASIC, DSP. Now, I'm not saying they're all going to go away, OK? But the tradition is, is that most of the applications were optimized for those specific hardware platforms, which then require changes for us to make in the host operating system, like in the kernel modules. And then we actually made changes in the application to suit those different build environments. But what NFE is really trying to actually adopt is we're really trying to say, well, that's great, but the customized hardware build slows the delivery process for us basically to instantiate a VNF and get it up and running. So now what you're actually seeing is companies like Ericsson, what we are basically doing is we are shipping software and hardware, but the software can actually run on multiple x86 platforms. So pretty much all of the software, the VNFs, that we actually sell today, with the exception of probably some transport nodes, runs on x86 hardware. And what that allows us basically to do by putting that inside OpenStack, it basically means that we can ship a VNF as a piece of software, we can use OpenStack basically to provision and configure that VNF, reduced from months to minutes. Now that's the ideology. Now we're still a little bit away to get there. So there is a couple of features missing in several projects. And you've actually heard Adrian talk about one of them. And one of the important features basically that we kind of need in terms of a configuration option on the Neutron API is VLAN trunking. And the reason why we need VLAN trunking is because we want to deploy that VNF with VLAN trunking enabled. And today we don't actually have that. So they're like some of the gaps that Ericsson and other community members are actually trying to support and contribute back to the community. So we can actually speed up the delivery process for a VNF to be provisioned within minutes. Now another important thing that I actually wanted to talk about today is we also have a strong collaboration with Intel around what we call the rack scale architecture. So we're actually going to launch this box. We talked about it in Mobile World Congress. It's called HDS 8000. And it's Ericsson's disaggregated server fabric, where we basically have a pluggable server for compute networking storage module. Now, the reason why I'm actually talking about it here when I talk about VNF is because this will actually run for VNF workloads and non-VNF workloads. So you could actually run some enterprise service applications or web-based applications. What we're also shipping today is basically an industry standard platform. There is no specific ASIC inside this box. We are using standard hardware commodity components. So let's talk a little bit about virtualization, right? So I think when NFE first kicked off, as Stephen actually mentioned, most of the focus was around hypervisors. And hypervisors are a great technology when you actually want to virtualize the actual physical infrastructure. It allows you basically to provide a lot more density on a specific physical server. And that's really, really good when you actually want to crank out a lot of density on that box. And it's also really good basically when you have VNFs that are built on different operating systems. So it allows us basically to run different guest OSs inside those VMs. So I could be running VNF from vendor A on that guest OS, VNF from vendor B on that guest OS, all on the same blade. Now, there's a couple of small little tricks around that. And the tricks basically is that you can remember Intel's main two virtualization technologies are required for that. So Intel VTX and Intel VTD are actually required to actually, so we can actually slice up and share the actual physical infrastructure components to be shared to all the VNFs inside separate VMs. So the latest buzz that we've actually heard in the last two or three years is containers. So what's the difference? The difference between containers is basically that you have an application, 
and typically that application is built with a common operating system, with common kernel modules, and it's great. Absolutely great. It's fantastic. But the problem is, is that when you actually have applications that require custom libraries and custom kernel builds, containers is probably not the bullet solution for everything. So what you'll probably end up seeing now, for example, is we're still going to have hypervisors. They're not going to go away. We'll have, still have type 1 and type 2 hypervisors. But what we could actually do is if we combine containers and VMs, we actually get to do something really cool. We can actually make use of the VM isolation and the density that we get from VMs and allowing us to run different operating systems. So in other words, if I have an application that I want to run a container and it's built, let's say, with Ubuntu 14.04 release, then I have another application that's not built on Ubuntu. It's probably built on, let's say, RHEL. Then what I'm allowed to do by actually having them inside VMs, I can run both container environments inside separate VMs on the same blade. So I get to take the benefits of containers and I get to take the benefits of VMs. Now, the question a lot of people have been asking me over the last one or two years, Alan, which VNF deployment am I going to pick? Am I going to pick hypervisors? Am I going to pick bare metal? Am I going to pick containers? This is really confusing for us. Which one is most appropriate? So let's take a look at that. Hypervisors really give us a lot of density, allow us basically to run an application that's built for a specific kernel module and a customized operating system. So VMs are really, really suitable for that. If you actually have and you require like true dedicated isolation, hypervisors are definitely the way to go. However, if you have an application that is actually going to consume all of the CPU and memory on a specific blade, like an actual, uh, let's say a load balancer or a router that's actually doing high years of playing packet processing, it would actually make sense to run that on bare metal. Okay? Or if you also have a brownfield application, a web services application, or a VNF as well that's also built with a common kernel and a, host, a common host operating system, it actually makes sense basically to run that on containers. Now there's one thing that the bare metal actually gives us that the other two solutions don't actually give us. There will probably be some regulatory requirements that will actually require a specific application or function to actually be locked down on a dedicated box. And some of the questions I've actually got from people say, well, Alan, why don't you just put it in a VM and put it on the box? Or why don't you put it basically in a container and put it on the box? You can do that, but if you really want to monetize your cost and reduce your capex, why not basically remove the need for the hypervisor? If you have OpenStack Infrastructure as a Service APIs supporting a provisioning and orchestration management system that can do provisioning of VMs, bare metal, and containers, why don't I basically be able to choose all three? And that's really the answer. There is no bulletproof solution for one or the other. What you'll actually really see is that depending on the VNF that it's actually been built, it will probably run better on bare metal. It will probably run better, basically, more performant on the bare metal. In other cases, if it's not CPU and memory intensive, and you actually want to crank out more density on the box, but it's basically using a custom kernel, VMs is the way to go. If it's actually using a common host operating system, common kernel modules, containers is the way to go. Or you can use a combination like I was also suggesting. You can actually run the containers inside the VM. So just to have a quick summary of what Adrian and also Stephen were talking about here, right? So I think the main point that actually Stephen from Red Hat was actually trying to emphasize is that we actually need to be transparent between all the communities. OpenStack, Etsy NFE, Open Daylight would actually be another one, and the OPNFE program as well. So we need to have a cross-collaboration so we can actually make sure that we get all the right specific configuration options supported in OpenStack to do the provisioning of all the different deployment modules. So you heard Adrian talking about like, you know, some of the contributions that are you know, being upstream. So there is still a little bit of work to you know, ongoing, let's say, for example, to support true SRIOV support, which I think is actually going to be important as well for containers and also for hypervisor modules. 
And then the other one is like VLAN trunking and a couple of other like configuration options that's actually missing, like for example, like on the Neutron API. Now, one other thing that I haven't really mentioned here is that today there is very little support for hardware acceleration in containers. Okay? So that's another thing that I think we'll probably start to address inside the community in terms of the orchestration and configuration options. So one example that's really important for VNF vendors is basically we actually ship a piece of software and typically what we want to make sure is we want to make sure that we're selling that VNF that will actually perform accordance to the SLA. So what that really means is I want to make sure that the application is actually going to run with a deterministic and predetermined state at runtime. So for us it's actually important to talk about CPU core pinning. It's actually important to talk about NUMA awareness and NUMA scheduling. Okay? So there is some work to be done for containers to support those specific configura configuration options to be automated in OpenSec. And then the last one, the one I was actually talking about from Ericsson as well, is what we actually see is that you're not going to have you know, a bulletproof solution where everything is going to be containers, or everything is going to be bare metal, or everything is going to be type 1 or type 2 hypervisors. It makes sense basically in the ecosystem, like in OpenStack, if we can actually support all three, well, then we're going to be able to support all the VNF type applications, workloads that we want to provision in an automated way. Okay. So with that, I'm actually going to take question and answers, and I'm going to invite my two colleagues, Adrian and Stephen, back up. And if you can actually use the microphone for any questions that we have. And don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, so question for the gentleman from Intel, or anyone, really. Uh, you talked about sort of having VNF-optimized nodes and compute-optimized nodes. but it gets hard for a provider to dimension how many nodes to set aside with hardware acceleration and how many nodes to set aside without hardware acceleration. So do you think that most people will end up just using compute VMs all over the place and you know just not bother about hardware acceleration and to get the uniformity of inventory? Mm -hmm. So um, there's a couple of answers to that, really. Uh, in many ways, I actually didn't talk too much about the hardware uh, acceleration capabilities you have in, in how we've laid things out here. Uh, there are options that you don't have to go to the, the uh, full steps of doing, let's say, whole space configuration that you need to specify aggregates. But if you choose not to take that type of a step, then uh, determinism and performance goes down. So that's more of a deployment consideration you need to make. Uh, when it comes to actual things like hardware acceleration, like, uh, let's say, uh, crypto or compression acceleration, uh, they are PCIe devices that you don't have to associate with, uh, let's say, uh, an aggregation per se. You can specify those through uh, flavor extra specs or image property type requirements. Uh, and the availability of those then depends on how many you've deployed in your environment. I also just want to tag onto that a little bit and explain some of the reasoning for recommending the aggregates in the situation. So in the example where we're using CPU pinning and large pages in particular, um, if I pin one uh, of my vCPUs on that box, I pretty much have to pin all of them because I have to pin everything else away from the core I'm giving to that one VM. Um, the other thing is that the huge pages, you lose memory overcommit. Um, so we can't overcommit the huge pages because that kind of uh, loses the performance that you wanted in the first place. Uh, so that's why in the situation where you're using both of those features, you really do need to separate the workloads as well. Yeah, go ahead. Minor question about uh, CPU pinning. Mm -hmm. uh, in in each of those cases, I think you were trying to give a justification for why you do that. Mm -hmm. And I think I didn't hear you say anything for the separate scheme. Uh, the separate, uh, why you might want to do that is um, you, if your application is, is ideally trying not to do, um, or sorry, not to have a, a lot of uh, interdependence between workloads. Um, it's a reasonable choice. I think isolated probably may be my preferred one, though. Uh, right. So if I was making recommendations, that, that's, that's the one I'd use. That's what it seemed. I mean, yeah. it, it seemed like separate is de-optimizing. I mean, it essentially non-deterministic. Uh, not uh, necessarily, again, not because no. you combine separate with uh, NUMA. And what you may get in that case is right. you actually pull these processes apart in terms of uh, execution units. The thing to remember is that uh, two physical uh, CPUs, when you're running an SMT mode, don't get you 2x the amount of compute resources. So if your policy is, is you want to do separate, what you're getting then is more, uh, more compute capability versus 
to sibling CPUs. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, you may choose that just as a way of um, boosting the amount of actual compute resources you want for two virtual CPU units, uh, while not needing full isolation like the isolate policy gets. Okay. Sorry, Alan. Any more questions? No, Sure. So, do you have any um, numbers available, especially around um, when you pin, when you, you know, colo, what are the performance benefits for typical VNFs, roughly? So that's a, a mileage will vary type of question, uh, and it very much depends on the workload. Uh, so for example, um, within OpenStack, really, I guess what I want to say is we, we're offering the tuning capabilities that VNF developers need to run efficiently. It's up to the VNF developers to design their applications in an intelligent way that that gets them the maximum uh, benefit. Um, yeah. So I mean, I think uh, exactly. So like one of the things you'll actually see is that like depending on the VNF uh, workload you're actually trying to provision, there might be some cases where you don't care about CPU core pinning. Let's say the application is like non-deterministic. Uh, if the application is deterministic, then it actually does make sense, you know, take to take advantage of CPU core pinning, like on new awareness, new scheduling. Um, it's really like from a case-to-case -case basis, actually, one vendor to the other will actually differ. Thank you. Any more questions? We've got one more yeah. here. Yeah, just, just take the microphone. If you, if you can just take the microphone. If you can just take the microphone. Okay. Sorry. Just to help answer, uh, last week in uh, Network uh, uh, NFV World Congress, Francisco uh, Javier Salmon from Telefonica published some number and result from some uh, um, what he call uh, uh, enhanced performance awareness, mm -hmm. so which is a combination of all the functionality we have been producing for NAV. And there are some numbers, so I invite you, it's all public document, I invite you to, to look at the number if published. Cool, thanks. Yeah, actually, on that point, there are a number of demos, public ones that we could. It's just I don't want to give a number for no, no, all the nice. <laughs> Okay, don't, thank you. Hi. Um, having seen a lot of discussion on NFV in the last few days, the other word people keep using is service function chaining. And I guess I'm interested that there's been no discussion here, and I'm curious as to whether you think the existing uh, networking APIs are perfectly adequate in that regard. I guess I'd be surprised if you said yes. <laughs> I'll let you guys yeah. handle that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, so we have yeah. work to do. I I think, I, yeah, I think I think we have some uh, some work to do basically around that. So. Um, I did the, the focus basically of uh, this talk was really to talk about the deployment options that you had, right? Um, when it comes to service chaining, yeah, I think there is, um, so there's a couple of different like methods that you can do to service chaining. Um, I think like VLAN IDs is one, like MPS label IDs is another. Um, I think some vendors, depending on basically the, um, the network overlay solution that they're actually going to use for tying those specific, you know, let's, let's call them like VNF options basically together. Um, some might be optimized basically for using VLAN, some might be more optimized for using MPS, like label IDs for tagging between one hop, like in the service chain to the other. Um, yes, I think there is a lot more work to be done in Neutron actually to support those. Um, but, I, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take time, but we're going to get there. I think yeah. uh, specifically with the service chaining, I think there's also a lot of people who have different ideas about how it should work, and that's right. where the use case discussion becomes very important. Yep. Yep. Uh, another point too is I think um, this talk was very much teed up more towards the NFE side of things. Uh, network connectivity uh, at this light, you could kind of more associate with SDN yeah. configuration. Uh, so. I mean, like, you know, you could actually take that as far as like, you know, uh, networking for containers. I think the, um, there's definitely some work to be done, you know, to, to have the same sort of like a provisioning and orchestration and management actually done that we have like in hypervisors to actually containers, for example. So uh, I think there's uh, still some yeah. uh, further workings ongoing that we actually need to add actually. Yeah, um, to next to question. On, just to follow up on the service chaining question, does it ever make sense to not put the elements of a chain on the same server? Might as well, is it is a safe enough policy to always schedule them on the same server? <laughs> because they're talking to each other. Right, so uh, so I think there's a... It, it seems like the, the permutations and combinations of characterization is so huge that it would be a great service if somebody actually provided a set of guidelines on So yet again, I, so I mean, that's a really good question, right? So uh, there's, there's like a couple of different answers, right? So I think the obvious ones basically is that depending on the workload, the traffic amount that you're actually trying to handle, yes, you could basically, you know, put all the VNFs like for that service chain, like on a single box. Um, if they're sufficient enough and they're going to be large enough, which a lot of them actually will be, um, I don't think you're going to see them like all sitting on the same node. 
Um, probably what we need to do is that we need to probably add some like uh, additional work around the Nova API for Nova Scheduler to actually you know have like uh, an administrator to say like you know it's a small enough like service chain. I don't really care about anti-affinity or affinity. I can actually like provision them like on the same uh, machine. And then there will be some other cases where you know it's actually big enough. And what I want to be able to do is I want to have some sort of affinity. Let's say if we're within the same pod, so they're all basically hitting the same switch, for example, right? So there's definitely some work that we probably need to add for an over scheduler to take care of those like specific scenarios. But um, I don't think it's a lot of work. It's basically like small minute changes that we actually need to contribute. Yeah. To actually I think those uh, cases. we need to pause there because we have to give one of you a computer before we leave. Uh, but we'll okay. probably be outside if you want to ask further questions. Yeah. Or continue so uh, thanks discussion. for coming, everybody, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the talk. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, I think it's my ticket, actually. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 621-3227. 621-3227. Great. All right. Oh, wait. Oh, we, we got, got a late take. Ah, uh, OK. Let me. 6213227. Yes, it we is, actually. We have a winner. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.